Acts chapter 3, and I, uh, last week I kind of took a little side note, and I really did that for the benefit of uh, Brother Keith's class, or Brother Lester's class uh, in here, and of course they, they uh, have studied that, but uh, anyway, it's been, uh, it's been really a, uh, a, a, when you think about history and the, the things that take place in the historical books, such as the book of Acts, it really, it helps us to know some of the background and the consideration of spreading the gospel and how that it, you know, it just didn't happen. It just wasn't an event. This was something that was, um, put into the works, as uh, Paul said, before the, they laid the foundation of the world. Uh, but anyway, it, it bringing about the gospel of Christ, uh, God using his people to, uh, to bring the Messiah into the world, and then, of course, uh, from there, the gospel being spread throughout uh, all of the known world. In fact, in Colossians chapter 1, I think it's 23, where Paul makes the statement that the gospel had been preached to the world, to the known world. And uh, it is amazing as to the events with, uh, within about 35 years, uh, the gospel first being preached there in Jerusalem, and 35 years later it has gone out and through, throughout all the regions of the Roman Empire. So the thing is that... <clears throat> It, it was a, um, what am I trying to say? The, the way that it spread, certainly it makes logical sense when you, when you think about all the things that took place and the things that were uh, going on. So, but anyway, <clears throat> we can look at it from a historical point of view and look at it from from that, but also we need to look at it from the, the point of view concerning, you know, how people obeyed the gospel because how they obeyed the gospel in the first century, they do the same today. There is certainly uh, no other way uh, as, uh, as to, obey, to obey God. So we have uh, within this the third, first... Um, 35 years of the church in the book of Acts, and then, of course, uh, we have the, some other historical accounts that, which are not inspired, but uh, they give us a little bit of insight. All right, so we've been on uh, chapter 3, and we've talked about Peter and John entering into the temple. We talked about how important the temple was, the man lame from his mother's birth, the details that are in the passage uh, where Luke describes this, you know, Luke being a physician describes the condition of this man as, he, as the apostles come to the temple to the hour of prayer. Uh, then, of course, uh, there is the audience, uh, and you will see that when miracles happen, it brings people together, which provides opportunity for that gospel, for the gospel to certainly to uh, to be preached. So I think we got probably down to uh, verse number 12 of chapter 3. And, and, and on page number 4, uh, where it talks about the progress of the church uh, from chapter 3, 1 through 11, Peter heals the lame man. Uh, he doesn't have silver or gold to give him, but he heals him in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Now remember, it has not been within a, a few years, uh, well, it's probably it's less than that, uh, been probably, uh, I would say, 60 some odd days uh, till the, um, uh, since the Passover, since the time that Jesus was crucified, then you had 50 days for the church to be established on the day of Pentecost. And then now here is in chapter 3 where he is entering into the temple. So in verse number 12, we'll read uh, a few verses there and then answer these questions as we go. I'm sure you've already done that. But it says, so when Peter saw it, he responded to the people, 
Now, they have, the, the people were greatly amazed. And, and that was the reaction. You have to understand that even at the teachings of Jesus, uh, they were, the Bible says they were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught as one having authority, not as the scribes. Here is a lame man who is healed by the power of, of God through the apostles, and he is leaping, and the people were amazed. That's one of the things that happens. And another phrase that you'll see is, is that there was fear that came upon the people. Um, when you have uh, an event that takes place, uh, it, it always causes a reaction of reverence or respect to God, and it has a way of attracting more people. Uh, for instance, when we get to uh, Acts chapter 5, there's Ananias and Sapphira who lie about what they have given to the Lord. And Peter confronts them. They die. But the reaction from that was that was great fear came, uh, fell among the people. And they, you know, they were careful to just simply to join themselves with the apostles. And it wasn't that they didn't obey. It meant that they had great respect and they understood what happened. So if fear came uh, on the people. Uh, that is a that you'll find that uh, in several occasions of the conversions of individuals. So uh, the, it, it's it's a reaction that has come from the fact that here Jesus or that Peter has healed this uh, lame man uh, from birth uh, that was lame from birth and has healed him. Um, so he says in verse number 12, So when Peter saw it, he responded to the people, Men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Or why do you look so intently at us? As though by our own power or godliness we have made this man to walk. In other words, what Peter is saying is that they did not do that themselves. It was not Peter and John that made him walk. So who was it? It was God, or it was the, the gift of the Holy Spirit, or the miraculous power, uh, certainly to heal. And then he uses this opportunity for this, ser uh, for this sermon. He says, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant, Jesus, whom you delivered up, denied in the presence of Pilate, when he was determined to let him go. Now, the phrase, and I think Brother Israel has talked about this too in his class, Abraham, Isaac, I see, uh, and then Jacob, uh, and it says, of course, the God of our fathers. In Genesis chapter 12 and verse uh, 1, one through three is the promise given to Abraham. Then, of course, that promise was also given to Isaac. And then the promise also was given to Jacob. And the promise was that there would be a land that they would inherit, but the Messiah would come through them. It would be funneled or been trickled through Abraham. Now, Abraham was perhaps the greatest uh, patriarch of the Jews. Uh, Abraham and Sarah, Abraham being the father of the Hebrew nation, so between uh, Abraham and Sarah, the Hebrew nation is born. Then, of course, it comes through Isaac, comes through Jacob. Jacob has 12 sons, uh, which make up the 12 tribes of Israel. Uh, and then, of course, the, they're called Hebrews. Um. God changes Jacob's name from Jacob to Israel, which means God's prince. God's prince. This is what his, his name is. And so from the time of Jacob, uh, he was referred to as, as Israel. And when he was... When he was coming back from Haran after he had married uh, his two wives, Leah and Rachel, uh, after he had married them and worked for his father-in-law for what, 20, was it 21 years? How many years was it? 
Anyway, when he comes back into the land and gets uh, to the place of Penuel, uh, P-E-N-U-E-L, I think that's how you spell it. Uh, he, he receives the vision. Uh, the fact is that God, uh, uh, he wrestles with an angel, wrestles with him all night, and then, of course, uh, the angel touches his thigh and it knocks his hip out of thing, but he says, you let me go, and Jacob says, not to you, bless me. And so he, he gives the spiritual blessing to Jacob. And so as Jacob is entering into the promised land, uh, God has uh, made this promise to Jacob uh, that he would be the spiritual leader of his people. And of course, the 12 sons later become 12 tribes. And then, you know, that happens by the, end, by the time you get to the end of Genesis, uh, the children of Israel or, or the sons have gone down into Egypt. About 70 of them have left Palestine area, come down into Egypt, and there they stay for about 200 and some odd years into captivity. And then, of course, the nation grows from 75 people to over probably, and a conservative number would be 2 million, 2 million people uh, by the time you get to Exodus chapter 1. From Genesis chapter 50 to Exodus chapter 1, you know, there is this development of, of this nation. So, uh, and, and God put them in captivity, uh, into the, uh, the Egyptian captivity to protect them. You know, who would be better to protect uh, a people to keep the enemies from coming in, to destroying it, to dividing the families, to, to splitting the family apart? If they're kept as slaves in Egypt, then of course um, they have the protection of the Egyptian army. They have the, the, the care for them. And then of course Moses is sent. Uh, at, when he's 80 years old, he is sent back to Egypt uh, to bring the people out of bondage. And that was a time where the people certainly would... Um, uh, be a nation to where they could come in and certainly to inhabit a, a land. So what he is saying in this, Jacob, of course, received this promise. And he says that he glorified his servant Jesus. So now Peter is attaching the name of Jesus to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They had crucified Jesus earlier. And now he is certainly identified with them. And that the very fact is that Pilate was determined to let Jesus go. But what prevented him from letting Jesus go and to, uh, you know, to keep him, to release him, what I'm trying to say. Yeah, the people got upset. The Jewish leaders had determined that they were going to how Jesus put to death. They used the Romans to do it. And when they, the custom of the Passover was to release a prisoner. And uh, so here is Jesus uh, as a, as a uh, on trial. And he is before Pilate. And Pilate says, who do you want me to let go? And what do they say? Barabbas, who was a murderer. Uh, and so Jesus was, was let or Barabbas was let go, Jesus certainly was, was crucified for that. He says, but you have denied the Holy One and the just and asked for a murderer to be granted to you and killed the Prince of Life, uh, whom God raised from the dead, of which we are witnesses. So, you know, the, the way Peter could, and John and the, the other apostles could speak so boldly is because of the witness of how of Jesus coming forth from the grave. Jesus was crucified on Passover or the day before, and then of course stayed in the grave three days, rose the first day of the week, uh, and then of course he appeared to his disciples for 40 days. 40 days, that 40-day period. 
he, he appeared to his disciples. In Acts 1, he tells them to tarry in Jerusalem, staying at Jerusalem, and they would be witnesses of me both in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. And so Jesus ascends up into heaven. And um, several passages, Mark's account says that he sat down at the right hand of God. Uh, Luke says uh, that he was carried up into heaven. Uh, Matthew uh, basically says the same thing. Acts chapter 1 says, says uh, the same thing. And, and so as Jesus was taken up into heaven, then you had, you, uh, you had 40 plus 3, the 3 days, which is 43. So how many days is it to Pentecost? Well, it's 50 days to Pentecost from Passover. So here you have 43 from 50. How many days is that? That's a week. Seven days. Seven days the apostles will be waiting for Passover or for Pentecost. And of course, this is the this is the time frame. You know, and you'll find that there is a waiting period, and, and we could probably go through and look at several scriptures. But when Noah was taken and put into the ark, how many days did he wait before it started raining? After God shut the door, seven days. He waited seven days, he and his family, seven days in the ark, and there was shut up. They were sealed. They couldn't come out. Nobody could get in, and they stayed there for seven days before it started raining. And so it, it, it's... it's you know, and I, I guess you could talk about how the anticipation of, of the event that would take place, the same thing happening here, you know, there was this waiting period. Of course, during the time of the 40 days, you know, Thomas, you know, he didn't show up for one of, one of the times that they came together. But, of course, you know, after Jesus appeared, and uh, the disciples or apostles told him he comes back the next week. And then, of course, Jesus appears unto Thomas there, too. And it was all to, to build their faith. Now they have seen the resurrected Savior. Now they have seen Jesus. He was raised from the dead. So all of these things that are being said in this sermon, the detail that is in there is going to strengthen the faith of not only the apostles, but also people who are studying and looking at the Old Testament and then putting the things together uh, is certainly going to fortify their faith too also. And it says his name through faith, verse 16, is his name uh, has made this man strong. Talking about him being uh, raised. Well, let me back up verse 15. And killed the prince of life whom God raised from the dead, of which... We are witnesses, and his name, through faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. Yes, the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect soundness in the presence of all. So the fact is that when the miracle was completed, when the miracle was performed, it was complete. This man had been lame from his mother's birth, and he hadn't used his legs at all. And now he is standing up and leaping uh, as he is walking uh, in the temple courts. And people see him. They know who he is. You know, he, he didn't have a, he probably wore the same clothes. He, you know, he, he was poor. I'm sure that he was poor, asking for alms. And the thing is, he is easily identified. And yet here's Peter saying, it's not us. By the power of Jesus, whom you, by the way, whom you crucified, but yet God raised from the dead, this is how he is walking. This is the power of the miracle. And that in itself will cause people with an honest heart to believe uh, Jesus certainly is uh, who he says he was. And he says, um, yet now, brethren, I know that you did it in ignorance as did also your rulers. But those things which God foretold by the mouth of all of his prophets, 
that Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send Jesus Christ, who was preached to you before, whom heaven must receive until the time of the restoration of all things which God has spoken by the mouth of all of his holy prophets since the world began. Now that's a mouthful, but what he is saying is that here, you know, Jesus was crucified. He says, you did it in ignorance, uh, and so did these rulers, and, and yet the fact that he is raised from the dead, the fact that this man was healed from his miracles, is the proof that he is alive and who he, who, who he is, that he is who he says he is. So um, the, the point is that here, not only is Jesus raised from the dead and that done by the power of God, but it was prophesied. All of these things were prophesied of the Old Testament. Uh, he is going to talk about uh, the holy prophets when you look in, into the minor and major prophets of the Old Testament, uh, well, you really you have, you have two, two kinds of prophets in the Old Testament. You have the oral prophets, and then you have the written prophets. Now, the oral prophets would be Elijah, Elisha. Um, who else would be an oral prophet? You had the, the young prophet or the prophet who was killed in 1 Kings. Uh, well, Jeremiah's going to be a written prophet. You have Isaiah is a written prophet. Uh, you have uh, Samuel. Uh, he is a written prophet. How do you spell that? Samuel's a written prophet. Uh, but, uh, you know, and then you have John the Baptist. He is an oral prophet. He didn't write a book. He didn't perform any miracles. Uh, but he preached hellfire and brimstone to those rulers. And, of course, uh, the whole Judea came out to hear John. But these prophets... And that's, that's the way we look at them. These are the one, the written prophets are the ones that you have in your book. Uh, and Samuel was probably responsible for a lot more than we give him credit for. Uh, but, but oftentimes, when it talks about the prophet Jeremiah, it is said in the book of Jeremiah, and it, it is actually another prophet is, is speaking, perhaps uh, Isaiah, all of the written prophets were categorized into one, into Jeremiah. And that's, that's the reason for that. That's, that's just the way that they, they did that. But I'm saying that to say this, that the prophet, his purpose was to bring the people back to God, to turn the people to God. Elijah is called the great reformer because it was on Mount Carmel where he stood and challenged the prophets of Baal and of the Astaroth. And of course, when the fire came down, when Elijah prayed, and it did not with the prophets of Baal, then that's when those prophets were taken down and they were killed down in the valley. And then, of course, the people says, the Lord is God. And of course, turning away from Jezebel's prophets and things of that nature. So Elijah was responsible for restoring Israel. And John is the one who is, restored, is uh, attributed to restoring Israel to, back to God in the New Testament, in, in the, the days of Jesus. John was a powerful preacher, and yet he didn't even perform a miracle. He didn't have to. Uh, but the Spirit of the Lord was with him. And of course, Elisha was also a prophet who was very beneficial. But then you have Jeremiah, who, who stood in the time of the captivity of Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, 
all from, from 605, actually from 620, from 620 B.C. all the way through 587. Jeremiah prophet that prophesied all this through the time in Jerusalem. And he watched Nebuchadnezzar come and he watched the nation fall. He watched Judea and, and Judah fall because of their rebellion and how they turned uh, to, turn to the, the gods of the Amorites and, and the Moabites. And yet Jeremiah suffered a lot of things. He was thrown in a sewer pit up to his neck. And that was a dungeon that he stayed in. Uh, he was uh, threatened to be killed, but even Nebuchadnezzar knew that Jeremiah was a prophet and protected him, protected him. And that was because of God. Isaiah being the statesman living in the palace of God, or living in the palace in Jerusalem and prophesying to a nation uh, that ha was turning away from God and all through the days of Hezekiah, you remember Hezekiah when God told him he was to get his house into order, he was going to die, he cries, he leans up against the wall. God adds 15 years to his life. But in that 15 years, uh, Hezekiah dies. And then his grandson uh, Manassas comes into power. And Manassas began, the Bible says, he caused his children to pass through the fire. That meant that he offered babies as human sacrifices. And he is probably the one who had Isaiah killed. Now we don't have it written in the scriptures where Isaiah was killed or what, whatever happened to him. But history, secular history, tells us that Manassas took Isaiah, placed him in a hollow log, and sawed him in half. You can read about that in the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 11. He says that some of them were sawn asunder. And 99.99 .99 of the Bible scholars says that was Isaiah. Uh, it, it, the, the evidence, the, the secular evidence is overwhelming. So I said all of that to say this, that God prophesied it. When you look at these books, not only that, the minor prophets, when you got the prophet Joel and you got the prophet Amos and you got the prophet Jonah and all of these, all of these have a message at the end of, of their book. All of the prophets do. You know what that message is? Hope. There's coming a Messiah. It's the hope that, that it is. And then, of course, you have another prophet, Habakkuk. Now, most of the prophets spoke to the people on behalf of God. But, but Habakkuk is speaking to God on behalf of the, of the people. And what Habakkuk's prophecy was, was that why do why do the, the innocent and the wicked suffer at the hands of the wicked? Why do they suffer that way? And God's message in Habakkuk chapter 1 is, well, they're going to get theirs. He says, I'm sending someone to take care of them. And it's the Babylonians. Chapter 2, Habakkuk is saying, why... Do you take an evil nation to punish the wicked in Jerusalem? And chapter 3 says God's going to take care of business. Babylon is going to get theirs. And then Habakkuk says whatever happens I will trust in the Lord. And that's what the message is. Whatever happens in this world we have to trust in the Lord. He says the just shall live by faith. You've seen that in passage in the New Testament. It comes from the book of Habakkuk. And it's about Habakkuk trusting God when he doesn't understand what's going to happen. And it's and the point that I'm saying is that Peter used the prophets of the Old Testament to talk about how that they was prophesied of the Messiah. Even Job says, I know that my Redeemer liveth. 
I know that I will stand in the last day. And that was the, one of the first books that was written in the Old Testament was the book of Job. It, it, it dates beyond or before the book of Genesis. Now, to just give you a brief thing, Genesis was written by Moses and was written at Mount Sinai probably or during the wilderness, 40-year period of wilderness. But the book of Job dates way before that. And the fact is Job, the book of Job is a, why do good people suffer bad things? That's what the book of Job is. And sometimes it's because of evil people. Sometimes you bring it on yourself. But then sometimes it just happens. And that's what he is, is saying in that. But I, and I know that I, I've said all of this. But I just want us to understand that as God prepared for the Messiah to come into the world, he made this preparation through all of these prophets, through a nation that was brought, that held into Egyptian captivity from Abraham to the time they were brought out was about 400 years. But as they were in captivity, in Egyptian captivity, held down in there, then, of course, he brings them to a land that will, God will bless them. And they stay there until they begin to fall after the idols. It's the, first of all, it's the Canaanites. And then it's the gods of the Assyrians. And then the, the tribe of Judah goes after the gods of Moloch, the gods of the Amorites and the Moabites. And they offer human sacrifices. And they offer human sacrifices here. So they go back into captivity and they stay there uh, for 70 years. That is the southern tribe, 70 years. But when they come out, now they have been tried with fire to bring the Messiah into the world. They have 400 years to do that in. From the time they come out of captivity, they have 400 years to get the walls repaired in Jerusalem, to get the gates open to get the temple worship back running and back working. And then, of course, having, when people come to the land, they come into Jerusalem to bring the people, the center, the location. Uh, and it's done all through time. And it's all done by the providence of God. Because when Jesus comes into the world, Jerusalem is a thriving city. It is a place where people have come from all nations of the world and goes back to the captivity. We explained that. And it brings the people together for the purpose of the gospel being preached because when they obey the gospel, then you've got them going back home. You've got them taking the gospel into the world. And that is, that is just simply the providence of, of God. So the thing is that Peter talks about this. So, you know, we, we've, uh, you could probably answer these questions all along, but under B on page four, it says, what did Peter uh, accuse his audience of doing? Well, first of all, they denied the Holy One. Secondly, they denied his release. And thirdly, they asked for a murderer to be released. And, of course, they killed the Prince of Life. So you can see how Peter is using this opportunity to show them what had actually happened. The Jews, the Jewish leader, says Jesus is a blasphemer. And, of course, they, they said that because of their hatred and their prejudice against him. Yeah, they called him the son of Beelzebub. How can he cast out demons only except by the power of Beelzebub. Jesus made a statement. He says, every house that's divided against itself shall not stand. You ever heard that statement before? Abraham Lincoln said it in a time of civil war, but Jesus said it first. So the point is this. Uh, you know, they, and then it says, question two, what does it mean to repent and be converted? What is the word repentance here? You know, there's two words for repentance that we find in the New Testament. One word is simply, I'm sorry, I got caught. Judas is the one who did that. 
Judas is the one saying, I'm sorry. He takes the money and throws it at the, the feet of the priest. The priest said, we ain't touching that. That's blood money. We ain't doing that. Judas went out and wept. Uh, and uh, he went out and hung himself. They took that money, bought a place to bury him with uh, in the field of blood. But then Peter, as he denies Jesus three times, even curses at the end, when Jesus looks at him, when the rooster crows, you know, Peter went out and wept bitterly. But we see where Peter changes. Peter begins to work and begins, and he is at the forefront again in, in the preaching of the gospel and being that person who the Jews look to uh, in matters uh, of God, of what God is saying. Yes. 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 Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and Brother Sewell's making a great point. What he's saying is that John has already talked to them. And when he says repent, the word repentance, which, which brings about godly sorrow, or godly sorrow brings about repentance, is that it is going in one direction and turning and coming back in a different direction. It's changing your mind and changing your actions. That's what it's doing. The repentance of Judas didn't change his actions. He killed himself, but that's all he did. He didn't change his life. But the true repentance, when he says repent and turn, that means to, to turn back to the Lord. It's, it's a U-turn, exactly right. All right, so the, he says that the, the word repent and converted is equal to Acts 2 verse 38. Repent and be baptized every one of you. It's the same message. It's the same wording that is there. All right, I appreciate your time. Let's see next week.